Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to Halifax. I know a lot of you had a chance to get around the city. I hope you uh, enjoyed the day for those of you do, who were able to. Those of you who got in late, um, it's going to be a long day. We have a big agenda, but uh, hopefully we'll keep it uh, exciting, keep everybody awake. I'd like to thank the team leaders for coming out, trying economic times. I know that uh, I've heard from many of you individually about the challenges you're having financially uh, in various labs. Uh, it's a tough uh, budget environment in a lot of countries. All the teams, uh, team members who showed up, and certainly our special guests, uh, Bert Vogelstein, who we'll hear from uh, on Skype this morning, Jeffrey White from uh, NIH, uh, Keith and Penny Block, and Charlotte Gillenhall, all uh, uh, from Keith's uh, uh, clinical setting, and Michael Gilbertson, where are you, Michael? Uh, thank you, uh, my co-founder uh, in our organization. And um, then I'm going to talk about the Halifax project. I, for, I apologize for some of you here the other day because I'm just going to spend two minutes on a little bit of the background. Uh, like many of you and mo most everybody these days, I, was, I had my own uh, family story about cancer when I was 18. My uh, grandfather, who was quite close to me, uh, died of cancer, and I was uh, visiting him regularly during the time that he died. And as an 18-year-old, that you know had a very profound and deep effect on me. Uh, that was me in the picture about the when I was five, which is you know a time when I was spending a lot of time with my grandparents. And his daughter, who was my aunt, is the woman in the middle there. When she was in her, she was a special play friend of mine when I was at my grandparents, and she died in her 40s. And so when she was like 47, I was 40, and, and she died of cancer. And I started digging in the literature just out of curiosity. I really wanted to know from a scientific perspective what was going on in cancer science and to understand it. And it was sort of like quicksand. It seemed like the further I got, the more I read of the academic peer reviewed literature, the more I realized I didn't understand. And the deeper I got, the worse it got. And I just kept going. I spent, uh, I, I tell people I'm a forest guy, I like to see the big picture, and there didn't seem to be too many articles that talked about the big picture from a scientific standpoint. All the literature is written for specialists. Uh, very, I was back at first principles, relearned my biology, ground up, um, really spent eight years, uh, sometimes five hours a day, a couple hours before breakfast, over lunch, uh, sometime in the afternoon, sometimes in the evening. It took me eight years before a light came on and I could finally see the big picture. I mean, I was lost in the woods for all that time. It was awful. And it was one of those things where I say it was like quicksand because it seemed like the more I read, the more I kept thinking, well, I've got so much invested here, I'm not giving up on it. And yet, the further I went, I kept thinking, really? It can't be this difficult. Uh, anyway, now uh, when I emerged from that event, I guess, uh, I had a few things that I saw in the literature that seemed to me as common themes that a lot of people were talking about. This little cartoon is just a picture of some a group of cells with the white ones being ones that get targeted with leftover cells that don't get reached with a the therapy, you know, what we all know as adaptive resistance, that mutated cells don't respond the same way to a targeted therapy and therefore we have residual cells that will come back and uh, from a clinical perspective show up to some form of relapse and possibly metastasis and you end up with refractory disease through this process of adaptive resistance. We've known this for decades, okay? Nobody, everybody knows that that's the issue. We've been at least since tamoxifen and probably a bit earlier looking at targeted therapies that essentially do the same thing and with the same kinds of results over and over and over. The second issue is not a trivial one and this is, uh, you know, one that is only certain journals focus on but it was one that really struck home with me and that was the issue of price. The cost of developing new therapies, there was a good issue in our Forbes magazine just like yesterday or something about the cost of new therapies and how they have inc the costs have escalated. Some 95% of all new drugs are rejected either on safety or efficacy. Um, and now we're looking at targeted therapies that can cost $10,000 a month. And that means that we really have therapies that are emerging that are unattainable by most of the world. Even the Western countries that can afford it are struggling to cope with the bill. And uh, some countries are ha really having difficulties trying to figure out how they're going to do this. And yet our pipelines are full of the same kinds of therapies that do the same kinds of things. And it doesn't take a simple, uh, it doesn't take an economist to figure out if, that if your patient base is smaller and smaller because you're focusing on targets for narrower and narrower groups, that it's a smaller group of patients that have to bear the costs of the development of that therapy and the price must go up. 
Um, the price now is somewhere well above north of a billion dollars on average being spent on a single targeted therapy. And so we're, we end up with these massive price tags for development being footed by smaller and smaller patient groups. And that makes it unattainable. In fact, most countries are being priced out of these therapies completely. So there's a whole host of countries around the globe who simply can't touch the new stuff. I mean, we've, we're essentially working on a system that is focused on providing cancer therapies for the countries who can afford it and ignoring the countries who can't. It's not anybody's fault. That's just kind of the way the system has unfolded, and it's unfortunate. Uh, it's systematically reinforced, in my opinion, because what happens is we have a clear split between research and development. In the old days, researchers who worked for nothing, for some public institution, took public funds, did the research, published it openly in the peer review literature without intellectual property, and we gifted it to industry for development. That was sort of where we started. Now we've got a situation where the universities and the researchers themselves have incentives to make sure that that pipeline works. And so now there's royalties come back to the institution, sometimes you know, as much as hundreds of millions of dollars. And individual researchers and individual institutions are working very hard to ensure they have intellectual property in place. Many of you know the system well. Uh, I'm not an anti-capitalist by any stretch. I don't want anybody to think that I'm you know, on some socialist uh, platform here. I just want to tell you that we have such a tightly coupled system right now that that's the way things work. And with, especially with uh, tight budgets um, and being what they are, uh, lots of people look to biotechs and other startups and other ways to leverage their intellectual property for additional funds for their labs to do the kind of research that has to get done. And I fully appreciate what's been going on in the labs themselves. Um, it's an incredibly important work, and we've done decades of effort to get to the point where we even understand the disease. So, I mean, I don't regret one inch of what's been done. Um, I'm just saying that we've created a system that hasn't really delivered what we need. This was combined with one other insight I had, and it was really about how combinations of chemicals could that were non-carcinogenic and ubiquitous in the environment might actually be acting disruptively on the mechanisms that instigate cancer to cause cancer in ways that it doses far below what anybody might have appreciated. And that was the nature of the first workshop we did on Thursday and Friday, and most of you are familiar with that. But I went to Theo Colborn originally, who is a scientist who uh, has done work in endocrine disruption because of her work in the field of environmental health, who pointed me to Michael Gilbertson, who's here today. And the two of us decided that if we were going to do anything, we would need help, because I was really a nobody. I'm not, despite many of your very polite emails saying Dr. Lowe, da 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 da, uh, my background was in underwater acoustics, software engineering, electronics. I, I, I was an aerospace engineering officer in the Air Force, uh, everything to do with anything but cancer. And for the last 10 years, even though it's been a very passionate obsession slash obsession hobby um, of mine, it's really not my field of study. And so I, you know, this is all about my project management skills and my insights into what the literature was telling me and trying to make something happen. And we decided we needed some help, so we went out and started asking researchers if they could assist. We, within, I was surprised within four weeks we had 40 scientists who wanted to be on the advisory board of a nonprofit that we proposed to start to instigate some research in this area. And many of the people that are circled in blue, or squared in blue there, Thomas Sanderson, uh, David Gilbertson, uh, Philippa Darbra, Elizabeth Ryan, and others, uh, and, and then in red, Keith Block, uh, Lynette Ferguson, who couldn't make it at the last minute, Anna Pam Bichet, many of them ended up involved in this project, but initially stood up and said, if you're prepared to do something in this area, we're prepared to get behind you, because the logic behind what you're attempting to do makes a lot of sense. Um, the, the, in the, what we really, what I was really, the question that I was asking was, in the clinic, we know that combination chemotherapy has some utility, okay? Uh, think about the days of early leukemia drugs, and I, when I was a kid, I was five years old on my bicycle, I ran into a boy in my neighborhood who was dying of leukemia, and he told me that he was going to die in six months. It was actually his friend who told me. Uh, but uh, that was normal at the time, and it was, you got leukemia, you were going to die in six months. And there was a lot of work done by some very diligent doctors on combination chemotherapies that extended that dramatically. And we know since that ch combination chemotherapy works. But we also know that disease heterogeneity and toxicity of combinations of chemicals often prevents it from doing its job completely. And so that's really been the frustration that, m that the field has faced. 
And the idea, the question that I was asking was, well, if we started with non-toxicity as a starting point, if we talked about chemicals that didn't have the, that had broad therapeutic index, if you were going to talk about a combination that could reach potentially dozens of targets, what would that look like? We started with safety as the very first starting point to try to avoid the toxicity issue. Um, what would that look like? And I had read an enormous amount of literature from the people that were doing chemicals in plants, which typically only get used as lead compounds for something that's more refined and advanced. But in fact, some of them are quite uh, capable. It's just that the pharma can't do anything with them sometimes from an intellectual property standpoint, and so they don't fit the model that we have in place, and they are often passed over in their pure form, even though they may be capable on their own. Now, I'm not saying that all plant chemicals are capable on their own, and I'm not saying they don't suffer from issues in bioavailability and toxicity in and of themselves at times. I'm saying that many of those chemicals are automatically discounted to start with because they don't have, offer the same kind of return on investment that the t pipeline that we've built needs. And so my question was, could we do something that actually set intellectual property concerns aside and take a broad spectrum of targets and act on them simultaneously through some regimen or some kind of approach that would allow us to act on all the areas of cancer biology that matter. Now, what are all the areas of cancer biology that matter? Well, one of the early papers that I found that helped me sort of orient myself to the forest, if you get my metaphor now, was the Hallmarks of Cancer paper. And I could see from the first paper, which I read, that it was missing a bunch of things because I'd been reading about dysregulated metabolism and inflammation, et cetera. And I actually corresponded with the authors who told me late in 2009 that they were coming out with a second version that would have some of these additional things in it. And ultimately, we settled on 11 areas, okay? So really, we ended up with 11 areas that we felt were representative of aspects of cancer biology that in total were reasonably cons comprehensive and that could represent areas where there was reasonable agreement and a broad depth, a fair amount of depth of research to support some certainty that these aspects of cancer biology mattered. And the, uh, pr what we had intended as a project was a complete paradigm shift on targeted therapies. Now, getting the field to believe that targeted therapies aren't the answer is not something that's going to happen overnight. I get that. Uh, but, you know, as some of our thinking has been evolved, we thought, well, maybe the outcome of this project could be something that actually use as complementary to targeted therapies, which is our first line against cancers where the mutational drivers are known and where the targeted therapies work initially and can get us the bulk of what we're trying to get, but then some sort of broad spectrum approach would be able to be used to prevent relapse or metastasis by trying to reach a much greater number of targets and make, take a stand against the heterogeneity that we know probably exists in the residual cells that remain, that don't fit the same prototype. The main goals for this project then, this workshop that we're here for, is to use cutting edge cancer biology to develop a broad spectrum of prioritized targets. That's what we want each of your teams to do. And then to identify prototypical examples. And I'm going to emphasize prototypical examples because I, in previous correspondence, talked about prioritized uh, therapeutics, and I want to talk about prototypical examples of safe approaches to reach those targets, I ideally free from intellectual property. I understand that every team might not solve this problem quite this way, but that's where, that's where we want the teams to start. Um, and to produce a coherent argument in the peer-reviewed literature, a landmark paper, if you will, that changes the paradigm, that changes the thinking, where each team essentially says, Given what we know about adaptive resistance in our area, we think that a series of targets would be more effective than a single target, and we think that there are chemicals that could be combined safely to, uh, or other approaches, not just chemicals, that could be used to act on these targets in a manner that would produce better results than single targets. And a series of articles, 11 of them, with a capstone paper that actually makes the argument that says, since we know all these areas of biology are important, we should be looking at further research that explores the potential that each of these teams has identified in research that actually finds out whether or not a holistic and integrated approach that addresses all these areas simultaneously could be effective at dealing with the heterogeneity that we see in cancers. Some of the challenges we're going to face is avoiding intellectual property and pipeline pharmaceuticals. That's a lot of what we have out there. And that's some, one of the reasons we put an emphasis on phytochemicals and other kinds of approaches. But I realize that this may not be completely possible. 
I want you to start with it as an ideal because there could be a way that if we produce something that is free of intellectual property, that it can be taken up by countries that are currently priced out of the system. Um, you saw what happened to AIDS drugs. If any of you are familiar, the pharmaceutical companies essentially got shamed into coming forward and making drugs available after many years of fighting by the people that knew that the therapies weren't making people that needed at prices that were affordable. And ultimately, they only did it because under the WTO TRIPS agreement, they were told that if they didn't give up that intellectual property, that the countries would take it. And so they did it with their one arm twisted, and they said, okay, we'll make it available. But we've got a situation where companies that are selling drugs for $120,000 a year per patient are not going to walk into countries that can't afford that and say, here, we'll make them available very cheaply, because they know the gray market will beat the system. People will be sending the drugs through various black market means to get to people that need them. It's a bit of a disaster, the system we've created, but that's just the system we have. If we can do the science to show that there's an argument that a broad spectrum therapeutic approach would be favorable over single targeting and make that argument in a top ranked peer reviewed literature, uh, peer reviewed journal to the scientific community, some countries that are priced out of the game right now may take it up in their own national laboratories. They may set out to do something on their own, pharma or not. And again, don't get me as anti-capitalist or anti-pharma because I don't believe for a minute that if this group was to produce something that was free of intellectual property as a model that the pharma companies won't come along and do something quite similar with a few tweaks of their own that will have an adequate amount of intellectual property to do what they do. I, I don't by any stretch mean we're going to circumvent the pharmaceutical companies. I'm just saying let's start with an understanding that it would be nice if we could produce a design that would be useful by all countries irrespective of how much money they have and let industry do what they do with it because they'll do it anyway and let the countries that can take it out of the literature for free with some advice on how to proceed act on it in a manner that will allow them to get to patients that otherwise wouldn't be able to get any kind of therapy at all that looks like anything that we have today. Some of the rewards of being involved in this project if we're successful is to produce a landmark paper that prescribes an engineered solution that address both problems, adaptive resistant and price, and they are both substantial problems. A solution that will have global applicability, a healthy amount of international collaboration because this is a project that is going to really take a large team to solve it. And I don't know whether this team after the design is done will be all that we will need. We may have to actually expand the effort into a second funded phase where we get a broad series, no, great number of labs combining to do something very substantial to, if we're going to solve this with the kind of horsepower, intellectual horsepower that it's ultimately going to need. But if we do our job right, the funding should follow because everybody in the room knows if they've been involved in this project that the academic soundness of uh, more targets than one makes sense and that if we're using, if our limitation on com combination chemotherapy is toxicity, that uh, we shouldn't be stuck at that and think that, you know, if we can only use two or three chemicals because that's what we're stuck with, really this group has got the capability and the knowledge and we've got a base of research now that should allow us to do something that's much more robust. Sorry, that's... Uh, all I can do for you in this time I have, but I just want to give you a quick layout of the format. We have our keynote address this morning, uh, a few keynotes for us, uh, for the group that will start in this lab. Uh, we're going to talk about integrative oncology research, uh, clinical approaches, and the cancer genome with Bert Vogelstein later this morning. We're going to have team reports from everybody throughout the series of the day. There will be breaks, however, if you're getting worried. Um, uh, this evening we're going to take a, we'll have a break at dinner time as we go back to the hotel and get a chance to uh, put our feet up for a, a little bit and then we're going to do uh, a dinner with a couple of talks at the dinner as well. And tomorrow we'll be much more relaxed, although today is quite intense, but tomorrow uh, we'll be doing breakout sessions and really trying to scope some of the issues, the challenges that we face 